Welcome to the first module in this series of short instructional videos focused on your health, the health of your patients, as well as your family and close friends. This instructional series was created by the University of Maryland, Baltimore County Department of Emergency Health Services with assistance from the Maryland Department of Health and funding from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This program is designed to meet the needs of first responders who are expected to deal with the health needs of people who find themselves in health emergencies they cannot manage on their own. These first responders are typically emergency medical services personnel, such as EMTs and paramedics, but can also be first aid trained firefighters, law enforcement personnel, and volunteers such as Red Cross disaster workers. Health officers in summer camps, youth clubs, and other organizations that work with groups of people who may have some vulnerability may also benefit from this program. The learning objectives for this program are listed here on the screen. We will start out in this current module with material to help you gain some basic familiarity with microbes, commonly called germs, the different types of microbes, and some of their behaviors. It is important to understand these concepts before we can move on to what we can and should do about our exposure to microbes and how we might accidentally expose others. As we move further into the program, we will learn about some of the basic ways of countering the harmful effects of some microbes through strategies and tools of prevention, mitigation, and treatment. Just as we work to learn to recognize the signs of a patient being in trouble, we will in this program learn to recognize the things that can put us, our patients, and our families at risk of becoming sick or even dying from microbial infections. We will also learn about methods of preventing exposure to microbes, as well as preventing us from transmitting microbes to other people, like our other patients or family members. Following this short introductory module, we will have an additional eight modules addressing the topics of emerging infectious disease and addressing the control of common infectious diseases. Now, we will begin with module one. In this first module, we will review what microbes are and the various different kinds. From there, we will look at some of the diseases that can be caused by some of the types of microbes that are common, as well as microbes that are uncommon or even emerging. In order to understand how to prevent or avoid diseases caused by microbes, we will first need to learn a little bit about the chain of infection. A common part of the chain of infection is vectors, or vehicles that carry microbes from one place to another. We'll spend a few minutes talking about vectors to watch for, as well as recognizing that EMS and other medical personnel can become unwitting vectors of disease. Finally, we will introduce definitions of epidemics and pandemics. Just a reminder as to why we are doing this training. The focus is to protect you, your patients, and your families. What could be more important? We all know that EMS personnel and other first responders are exposed to a variety of dangerous situations. Let's make our work as safe as possible for you, your patients, and your community. We'll start out with a basic description that will likely be a review for some of you. The idea is to get all of us a base level of understanding of what we're dealing with before going forward. Microbes, sometimes called germs, are too small to be seen with the human eye. As you can imagine, several hundred years ago, when humans developed microscopes, they were astonished to find all kinds of small, mobile animals moving around in water and on surfaces. These super small animals they saw with the microscope were called microbes which even to this day remains a catch-all term for the bacteria, viruses, and microbial parasites we'll soon be talking about. It's important to note that we would not exist without microbes, and in fact, life as we know it would not exist. Microbes are responsible for a significant portion of the oxygen we breathe, the foods we grow, and our ability to digest foods in our intestines. Here we can see some examples of disease-causing microbes. The bacteria group A streptococcus causes strep throat, while the bacteria salmonella can cause food poisoning. 
Viruses such as rhinovirus cause the common cold, while the influenza virus causes both seasonal flu and dangerous novel flu, like the one seen in the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918, which resulted in an estimated 50 million deaths worldwide. There are six basic types of microbes for which we will provide a basic description in the next few slides. Archaea, bacteria, fungi, protista, viruses, and a kind of hybrid we call microbial mergers. But we will only focus on bacteria, fungi, and viruses. We will discuss microbes that are relevant to your health and safety in the pre-hospital environment. Bacteria make life possible, but some of them can also take it away. Some kinds of bacteria are responsible for much of the oxygen we breathe, and through this and other chemical byproducts from bacterial metabolism, they created the conditions needed to support life on our planet. Bacteria play major roles in our digestive system, breaking down many of the foods we eat, as they do in many other animals. They are also important in helping us create some of our favorite foods, particularly fermented milk products. Some bacteria can remain viable over a long period of time and under extreme conditions. Unfortunately, some bacteria are responsible for many of the diseases and infections that afflict human beings, as well as other animals, such as Clostridium difficile, commonly known as C. diff, streptomonia, tuberculosis, tetanus, and typhoid fever. Bacteria spread in the environment can be limited by the use of antibacterial cleaning agents. Many bacterial diseases can also be controlled by antibiotics. Unfortunately, careless use of these antibiotics has led to some of the bacteria developing resistance to these medications, making it harder for us to help the body eliminate these bacteria and become cured. In this slide, we see some of the bacterial diseases of consequence, all of which can result from direct or indirect exposures from patients. For example, both MRSA and C. diff can enter our bodies long after they were brought into our ambulances by sick patients. This bacteria can remain viable for a significant period of time on various surfaces in ambulances. Viruses are not living cells and cannot reproduce on their own. When viruses come in contact with an appropriate living cell, they penetrate the cell's wall and use the resources of that cell to replicate themselves by the millions. In the end, the host cell burst and the newly formed virus particles are spread out into the body of the host animal or person. Unfortunately, antibiotics are not useful against viruses. The primary protection against viruses is through infection prevention techniques, hand hygiene, and the use of vaccines, which prime the body's immune response system to fight against the particular virus included in the vaccine. Recently, antiviral medications have been developed against some viral diseases, but they are, in general, not as potent against viruses as antibiotics are against bacterial diseases. Humans have suffered from viral diseases for tens of thousands of years, but it wasn't until the development of the electron microscope in the 1930s that scientists were able to see viruses and start to describe them and their means of reproduction. Early in human history, stories were recorded of mass epidemics of diseases such as poliomyelitis, measles, smallpox, and influenza. As mentioned earlier, the influenza epidemic of 1917-18 is estimated to have killed around 50 million people with some epidemiologists now suggesting the mortality was even higher than that. Many of the most lethal viral outbreaks have been in the influenza family. However, diseases like yellow fever and smallpox are examples of highly infectious viral diseases that have killed many millions of people historically. Newly emerging or re-emerging viral diseases like Ebola virus disease with its high fatality rate are reminders that past successes in developing antiviral immunizations do not guarantee protection against new viral outbreaks until such time that new methods are developed to control or eliminate such diseases. In these pictures, you see electron microscope images of the Ebola virus on the left, and on the right, 
a human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Here, you can see that virus particles are much smaller than the cells they invade, and yet are capable of taking over the host cell in such a manner that the host cell serves as a production site for thousands or even millions of new virus particles. Microbes are everywhere, but for the most part, they are too small to be able to transport themselves for any distance. Instead, they are transported around by both non-living forces like wind and water, as well as by living beings. We'll call these forces that transport microbes vectors. A vector is a person, animal, or non-living object that can transport microbes. For example, water doesn't get sick, but many microbes can enter the water we drink and be transmitted to the animals and people who drink the water. People and animals can serve as vectors, either directly through touching, sneezing, coughing, or sharing of bodily fluids, or indirectly through leaving microbes on surfaces that other people can then touch. Recent research shows that ambulances can be vectors of many kinds of microbes that can be harmful to humans if the ambulances are not thoroughly decontaminated. The same is true of many surfaces that people touch in hospitals and other healthcare settings. The world of infectious disease is constantly changing. For example, old established diseases such as West Nile virus, which is a virus transmitted by mosquitoes, have been around for many thousands of years. However, as the climate gets warmer, mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus expand their territory to include humans with no previous exposure to the virus. Some infectious diseases go dormant for many years, perhaps existing only in a remote animal population, and then reemerge into the human population due to human-animal interaction. Ebola virus disease is an example of this. Sometimes a microbe will mutate and cause disease in humans and other animals whose immune response systems have no experience with the new microbe. The influenza viruses are famous for this. A recent example is the SARS epidemic that affected East Asia and, thanks to air transportation, Canada as well. One of the big concerns of public health experts is the probability of the occurrence of future pandemics due to microbes that are new or have mutated in such a way that our bodily immune response systems have no experience. These are called novel, which indicates they are either a new microbe or more likely a new version of a microbe that has existed for some time. The influenza viruses are well known for their ability to mutate into novel versions for which existing vaccines are not effective. The term epidemic is used in the fields of epidemiology and public health to indicate that a particular disease or condition has significantly increased above the expected level in an identified population. The term can also refer to other public health issues such as drownings, violent deaths, or drug overdoses. The term pandemic is an extension of the term epidemic, but is used when the epidemic affects numerous countries at the same time. This is an important distinction. Given limited healthcare resources, it is much easier to respond effectively to an epidemic when it is confined to only one country or a limited geographic area than to a pandemic that covers many populations that cross numerous national boundaries. It's clear to all of us that we can catch some diseases directly from the people or animals who already have the diseases. This is called direct contact. Healthcare workers are in contact with such people on a daily basis. This direct contact can take the form of touching or being touched by the people who are sick or by touching their bodily fluids, as well as inhaling their exhaled breath, particularly if they are coughing or sneezing. The microbes can enter our own bodies through the mouth, nose, or eyes. Sexual contact is also another common route of transmitting microbes from one person to another. The primary method of preventing transmission of infectious microbes on non-living surfaces, such as in hospitals, ambulances, and restrooms, is through thorough cleaning with antimicrobial cleansers. For healthcare personnel, we also use wearable barriers to decrease our exposure to disease-causing microbes. 
Some examples include exam gloves, masks, eye protection, and gowns. If we fail to use sanitary techniques, we also can become powerful vectors of disease as we move from patient to patient, setting to setting. As we will see, body substance isolation techniques are only part of this unfolding story. The chain of infection is a concept used to assist healthcare workers with identifying risk of transmission and ways they can intervene to reduce transmission. Understanding the chain of infection can help healthcare providers prevent the transmission of disease from their patients to themselves and their communities. We will discuss this topic in further detail in Module 2. In this introductory session, we have discussed what microbes are and some of their roles in both supporting life and threatening it. We know that microbes are everywhere and that they have many different ways of getting into our bodies, some of which we can control. We also know that healthcare settings are often places where there are many microbes found and that we need to be able to limit those microbes as much as possible and decrease their passage from one person to another. This video-based instructional program is designed to help you protect yourselves, your patients, your families, both while on the job and throughout the rest of your lives. This information is vitally important in normal times and can be life-saving when we are faced with novel microbes. We can't cover everything in this module or even in this training program. Fortunately, there are many sources available on the web that are both accurate and interesting. An example is the YouTube video listed on this slide, posted by the National Public Radio on the topic of how viruses invade the human body. We will list similar additional sources in the next modules where appropriate.